So the last piece is around reporting to stakeholders and there is a column in the m and &E plan tab in the project builder that, at, that asks you to think about this as well. Um, re remembering that reporting is not just about funders, it's about all the stakeholders that have been engaged in the project. Um, so you need to think about what is the salient information? What are the key takeaways or learnings that are going to be the most relevant to different stakeholder audiences? What do you want them to focus on? What do you want them to be thinking about as a result of the, the learnings that you're sharing? Um, what is the most appropriate way uh, to share learnings uh, and information back out to different stakeholder audiences? You know, you might develop a very technical report that's going to go to your technical stakeholders or um, you know, implementing partners or your internal project team or your board of directors or whatever, your funder, um, but that might not be the best way to present information to your beneficiaries, right? So what it would be a, an appropriate way to share content with your beneficiary audiences or with your local community stakeholders. Um, there's lots of different options there. Is it going to be printed? Is it going to be distributed on paper? Is it going to be digital and sent out by email? Is it something that can be seen appropriately on a mobile device as opposed to a computer? All of those kinds of considerations. And then I would think about, ask, uh, encourage you to think about how your sharing of information around this particular project connects with your organization's overall uh, communication plans and fundraising plans in terms of outreach and stewardship of all of the, the potential uh, contributors to your project as well. I would suggest that if you're doing, a, if you've got a project that's got a really good monitoring and evaluation plan uh, and learning plan and you've got some sort of rolling profiles or case studies or focus groups or things where you're getting actual human stories as well um, that really goes a long way to being <laughs> your communication uh, you know feeding content uh, for a, a pretty good communication and fundraising plan as well so back to our little project here here's an example of here here we've seen success we've we've seen uh, year over year improvement in average income it's been steadily improving um, among farmers and community X um, a little narrative explaining uh, what your what your audience is looking at that the biggest jump was in the first year because that's when farmers adopted new methods and received new high yield seeds and in subsequent years, income growth has continued as yields improve thanks to healthier soil conditions. And women farmers in particular have begun accessing new markets uh, with their, uh, their produce. So this is a great way to share information about the success of the project for people who like numbers and charts and graphs and uh, want to see sort of evidence of efficiency and, and that over time. Um, you notice it's still, even when you're using numbers, I really encourage you to explicitly tell the story of those numbers. Don't necessarily assume that people can look at a, a chart um, and understand what it means in terms of the change that's been achieved. Um, and you're gonna want to point your audience to the key takeaway. And in here, the key takeaway is success, monthly income has been steadily increasing. Another way of telling that same story is by actually telling a story. So here is so-and-so. She's a 28-year-old widow in Community X, and she's walks here she walks through her field of maize. And she says she is grateful each day for her healthy fields. The income she now earns is enough to provide well for her three young children and to care for her aging father who lives with the family. School fees, food, and health care are no longer a worry. And as she says, this new income may seem small, but I am now free to have big dreams for my children's future. Same story. Just out of curiosity, you guys are all technical project people on the one hand, right? Uh, which, which version of the story made you feel like the project was a success? Number two. Christy says number two. Number yep. two, Pendo. That's so encouraging to hear the story. 
Yeah, number two. So that's just a little a little plug for the importance of the qualitative piece and <laughs> getting people to share share their stories and talk about their experience because um, I would suggest even funders uh, that want to see lots of pretty charts and graphs and technical reporting they're all human at the end of the day and all of us are going to have a more emotional response which is a, always a good thing um, to human stories right and uh, stories of real people and how their lives have improved. Uh, there were just a couple of questions that were uh, posted in the chat a minute ago that I didn't want to miss. So one is, would SMS data collection be a good option on questions that people may not want to answer and would prefer to be anonymous? And if you know of any uh, good platforms that you can use for collecting data through SMS? Yeah, um, I mean, sending sending text messages uh, presumably to a contact list would not be anonymous, but if there was uh, a platform where you send a link and people can answer that question, the data is collected on the other end of it, um, that would perhaps allow them to answer questions that, and I, I worded it a little bit off, not that they wouldn't want to answer, but that they wouldn't want to be identified in their answer. Um, and, and instead just would be fine with, with providing that information so long as it's not attached to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, a lot of that, um, I think would be relevant in, in health data in particular. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, the question I had was whether there were platforms that could, or links that could be sent through SMS that could anonymize the answers um, and you know how that could be used in areas where the participants would not necessarily want to be identified in in their answers mm -hmm. i think it would be difficult yeah i think it's possible um even things like using the kobo system unless you ask people for their name or ask them for a participant ID or some sort of um, identifier, then all the data is, would be private. So the default is going to be that it's private. Um, and if you need it to be associated with a particular individual, that's actually something you would need to actively require an answer for. Yeah. That's really good to know. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Of course, anything where you're, um, it really depends too, uh, in terms of the, the privacy aspect is there's the ethical concern and then there's the recognizing, depending on the data you're collecting, people are gonna be shy about sharing or uncomfortable around sharing. The other consideration is how you structure your indicators, right? So depending on how you structure your indicators, you may need to know that this person's answer changed over time, right? So if you're tracking um how many people demonstrated improved knowledge you need to know individual level data change over time but if you look at if you structure indicators as you know overall you know the overall um uh let's see like how many questions people got right over time as a group then you could just look at the average and show that the average has improved or average knowledge has improved. So it, it depends. So you, if you're concerned about privacy, make sure that that's one of the things you ask yourself for each of the indicators you've developed is, can I actually track against this indicator without knowing who's providing the information? Mm -hmm. yeah, I wonder so, if there's a way to assign numbers um, yeah. for, for forms and just have a you know case, yeah. case number one uh, without yep. being named. The other thing about access is, is the access point too, right? So you could assign a number and say only one or two people know who the individual and their, their number, and then anyone could look at the raw data and not know who they're look, whose information they're looking at. The other way to control against that is to just use names but to be very explicit and very careful around access so that only the handful of people who need that information 
and need access to the raw data are looking at the raw data and everybody else would be looking at anonymous data. And it's simply, you might export and have one spreadsheet that shows the data attached to the individual. You simply delete the column, you know, create a copy that's for, you know, broader access that does not include the names or maybe other members, other stakeholders are only looking at the rolled up data and they're not looking at individual responses. And then I guess if the participants know that that's the process that you're taking or some, uh, some version of it, uh, they may be more candid in, in their responses. Yep. But the key with the, I think what you were um, getting to with the, one of the questions, the original question um, around mobile data collection is, yeah, when you hand someone uh, a tablet or, or they're using their own mobile phone, the key is, is that the individual person who's there with them or the people that they're interacting with won't necessarily know what their answers were, right? So you may even have a situation where the individual who's implementing the activities, who's working with the communities directly in person is not necessarily the same person who's going to see the personal data, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good to know, thanks. As always, please don't hesitate to connect with myself or with Katie if anything comes up you know, an hour from now and you think, oh, I wanted to ask about this other thing or you have an idea or you want to run something by us, we're quite happy uh, to answer questions and uh, engage at a later date. And certainly as you're working through um, the next time you find yourself in a project development phase and you're working through your monitoring and evaluation plan, I'd love to take a look if you want to run some indicators by us or if you have any questions at that time, we're, we're always here. So. Uh, please do stay in touch and see how we can uh, support your work as you move forward. Yes, and of course on that theme, we want to make sure that um, our mark of success from doing this training. Just want to know uh, that, you know, if you're adopting the Project Builder tool, um, how has this training been, been useful to you? So any feedback that can come back uh, will help us to also learn and and provide um, sessions in the future that are also evaluate other topics which we certainly plan to do um, and we'd also love to hear uh, from you on what some of those topics of interest would be um, so please feel free to get in touch about that in previous sessions by Claire which have been excellent and um, and they've been uh, put into uh, uh, a playlist of very short segments of the things. So you can watch different segments of things that you're interested in. And I would assume that you guys may end up doing that to this one as well. So it makes it convenient to go and look at it. And then if you see something that you really like, you can actually copy the link and send it to some of your colleagues about mm -hmm. a segment that is particularly important to what you're working on today. Okay, so the idea is that you have these different, these different playlists that, um, uh, that allow you to uh, just focus in on, on exactly what you're working on that day. Because uh, there, there's a quite a bit of material covered in each yeah. one of our sessions. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, everyone. This was really fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, hey, Claire.